Hi there, thank you for joining me. Uh, today we're going to be exploring psychological warfare and subversion techniques. A lot of people recently have been asking me why it is that we're living in this sort of uh, society, this civilizational collapse uh, phenomenon that's taken hold and why uh, this has happened and in fact what is causing it, what the root causes are of this problem. So we're going to explore that today and we're going to be speaking about three main ideologies which were prominently uh, and predominantly responsible. Cultural Marxism, Islamism and the subversion of feminism. Now cultural Marxism was started at the Frankfurt School and one of the key contributors to the thought process within the Frankfurt School was Antonio Gramsci who wrote his definitive works in 1925, arguably. Gramsci was a historicist and a moral relativist. And what that means is, he didn't believe in any such concept as objective reality. He believed all truth was subjective, and that uh, one couldn't definitively say that something was what it was, i.e. It, it, it was completely a slap in the face of Aristotelian logic uh, and the principles of logic which were set down, of course, by Aristotle. Gramsci was also a very heavy believer in political and ideological superstructures. This meant he was very much in favour of governmental control, uh, super states, uh, in superposition, so to speak, uh, and he was always looking to increase the power of the state, uh, i.e. he was an authoritarian. Now, one of the proponents of cultural Marxism and Gramsci's ideas was Saul Alinsky. And Saul Alinsky wrote the book Rules for Radicals. If you haven't read that book, I would strongly suggest you do, because it set down the precepts for warfare, engagement and uh, subversion uh, within any structured society. Now, a lot of people will say, well, what's the problem with that? Alinsky just wrote a book. The problem is that Rules for Radicals was not just a book. It was a brainwashing tool. Because, again, it repeated and reiterated the historicist and moral relativist position of Gramsci. Now, you can see that uh, cultural Marxism is a direct offshoot and a derivative of uh, Soviet-style, Soviet-era communism. It's a sort of a soft version of it, if you will. And the reason for that is because, uh, while arguably the communist state was based on Marxism, they didn't believe that, uh, like Marx believed, that capitalism would collapse in and of its own accord. And so Gramsci's band of rebels, i.e. the Frankfurt School, uh, decided in their infinite lack of wisdom that they would bring it about. And this was to be done through the long march through the institutions. Uh, and this is prominent in the writings of Herbert Marcuse and so forth. Uh, whose works, again, uh, I would recommend people read if only to familiarise themselves with the dangerous ideologies hidden within. And of course the long march through the institutions uh, did happen. Uh, the, there was uh, heavy infiltration and subversion of educational establishment, academic institutions, uh, governmental institutions, uh, political offices, and also intelligence services as well. And this is plain to see, for example, <coughs> from the Cambridge Five. Uh, also recently in the Metrokin archives was exposed the KGB's links to the second ideology we're going to talk about, which is Islamism. And the Metrokin archives were made public in 2014. I would advise you to uh, look them up if you can. There are books on the subject um, which have recently been released so please do read into that. Uh, but we do find that, for example, with the Palestinian Authority uh, and the terrorist organizations that were around then, the PLO and so forth, the former KGB had a great deal of influence in terms of the thinking of these people and the funding of these people. Uh, there was a very strong um, element of former Soviet era 
spy masters funneling and financing uh, many of the terrorist organizations that we even see today. Now, Islamism as we know it today was founded by the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, a lot of people don't understand this. Prior to 1924, the present mod modern model of Islamism didn't exist. When the Cairo edition of the present-day accepted Quranic text was released, which was in 1924, that was the point at which many of these groups uh, in, in, uh, in terms of Islamic terrorism, Wahhabism, Salafism, and so forth, really took off. Um, and the 1924 Cairo edition uh, standardized text, of course, uh, was uh, okayed by King Fahd in Egypt. And in Egypt, of course, we saw the Muslim Brotherhood really take root. Um, it was founded in 1929 by Hassan al-Banna, uh, who wanted to overthrow the legitimate government in Egypt. And of course, today is still playing a prominent role in Egypt's politics, uh, as well as global politics. Uh, and, and this is plain to see through what has happened uh, since the Arab Spring. Uh, but thankfully, they've now been deposed by the military in Egypt. They're a very dangerous group because you can trace a direct line straight from the Muslim Brotherhood to Al-Qaeda and even ISIS today. And this is because the predominant thinkers within the Muslim Brotherhood, just like with the Frankfurt School, all wanted to try and exert their form of totalitarianism and authoritarianism and control on the people and the civilizations of those regions. And they successfully did this. They played a key role, for example, in the Saudi royal family getting installed uh, in Saudi Arabia, they lent a, a legitimacy to their uh, rulership, if you will. Um, as did the British with the Lawrence of Arabia, of course. This is all historical fact. Um, the third ideology is subverted feminism, which, again, a lot of people don't fully understand it. Subverted feminism, or second wave uh, feminism, what, what they did in that uh, organization was to map class oppression or class oppression theory straight on to biological sex. Now this was done primarily by an organization called the CWLU in 1972 uh, which subverted feminism into what was called socialist feminism which again in and of itself was funded by elements within the former Soviet Union uh, particularly the KGB uh, whose main uh, activities were not James Bond style, as it were, they were more to infiltrate and, again, subvert. This is what the subver subverters and subversives did, uh, was to take something that had a noble ideology or, or a noble idea and make it into a dogmatic ideology which was self-destructive. And so what each of these three areas have in common is totalitarianism. So they're all totalitarian by default, by nature, and they've all worked hand in glove. This is the one thing that you will not hear other people talk about. They've all worked hand in glove to achieve their singular aim. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're all communists or anything remotely like this. What I'm saying is there has been an overarching ideological um, similarity between them that has forced a cohesive bond between them which has proven to be very, very dangerous, even more so, I would argue, for the present-day Russian administration. Uh, but again, uh, those, are, those are things we can speak about perhaps in the next video. Um, but this totalitarian concept is not the only thing that they share in common. They also share in common a utopian ideal or utopianism. Cultural Marxism, for example, promises a, a, a veritable utopia, or the emergence of it, after the fall of capitalism, or the forced fall of capitalism. Islamism does something very similar. It promises paradise, or again, a vision of utopia, uh, after the fall of every kafir or non-believer. Uh, so we see that uh, playing very prominently 
uh, both in both these ideologies and the radicals that are involved in both of them. Incidentally, the word radical, of course, crops up in modern parlance associated with terrorism, which, as, as we described and discussed in terms of Bill Ayers and the Weather Underground and rules for radicals, uh, would, have, would have applied to them as well. <clears throat> Feminism does something very similar. It's based on a, on a flawed concept of patriarchy, which was never truly fleshed out. There were some legitimate concerns that first wave feminism had. Uh, again, people would argue on both sides of that, whether that's true or not, uh, whether in fact uh, first wave feminism was a, was a white supremacist movement in and of itself. Uh, these are, these are uh, questions people should be asking. Uh, but um, I would argue that primarily it is set out and, and it started to do things that were in some form attempting to improve uh, gender relations uh, so that the balance and control aspect uh, was a little bit more even. Unfortunately, when you get socialist feminism being the predominant type of feminism there was, which was second wave, it gave rise to and it gave birth to third wave feminism, fourth wave feminism, which are, have become very, very destructive for gender relations and uh, for family units and so forth, which weaken, of course, a country, uh, which is exactly what psychological warfare and subversion techniques are all about. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these in even more depth. So the first question to ask is, what is subversion? Subversion is the aim to destroy the country or geographical area of a perceived target enemy. Typical targets include students, artists, politicians and journalists, and sometimes even intelligence agents. Steps to accomplish this. Step 1, stage 1, demoralization. Stage 2, destabilization. Stage three, crisis, and of course you have stage four, which is uh, called normalization, which is a sort of a tongue-in-cheek term. Now we'll look into each of these separately uh, to discern exactly what they involve. So step one in this process is of course demoralization, which tends to be overt, legitimate, and it's a form of indoctrination or brainwashing uh, people into a cult-like behavioral response. This typically takes 15 to 20 years to indoctrinate one generation of students generally, because that's who they tend to target. Uh, they also target journalists and people who are easily swayed to their point of view via psychological manipulations. Uh, the target areas, of course, are education, media, law enforcement, social or gender relations, and of course, parent-child relations. Uh, you see very, very clearly in the education system, for example, that schools are not where people go anymore to get educated, uh, or perhaps they do in some regard, but it's really more a form of indoctrination. And if one were to read the work of uh, Charlotte Isabel, uh, you would find that uh, her conclusions with regards to this are quite damning. We've got a data-heavy... Uh, reason devoid education system where a lack of critical thinking is applauded. So uh, they've already succeeded on that front. The media is very much the same thing. I mean, the media is a non elected group of um, what could loosely currently be termed journalists. There's no investigative journalism from, from most uh, people who call themselves journalists. So uh, we see very clearly that the process of subversion has uh, been completed in these two areas. Law enforcement is another area where we're finding that we're running into some real problems. Uh, again, this is, this is a direct result of, of agitation and, of course, Alinsky's methodology is being applied and the general methodology of sub subversion and psychological warfare. Religion, interestingly, is another key area that they tend to target, and this might confuse some people as to why they would do that. It's not because religion necessarily is a great institution. Of course it's not. There have been horrendous things done uh, in the name, of, name of, of any religion or by religions themselves. Uh, but 
by religion what we're really referring to, particularly in the West, would be a sort of a docile form of Christianity, if you will, uh, and uh, Judaism and whatever other prominent sort of uh, belief systems there are that help people to try and reach towards the numinous. Now, I say this not being a religious person myself at all, uh, but it is important to note that that is a key, a key area of their targeting. And what they do with religion is once they've destroyed the uh, ideology of religion, they replace it with their own ideology. Uh, and religion is a very easy area to target because obviously uh, when one looks at the uh, atrocities that we discussed, uh, it's very easy to turn people away from believing in anything higher than themselves. Or, in many cases, to believe there is nothing higher than themselves, which we'll get into. So, once it's replaced with a nonsensical, superstitious and subjective form of New Age woo, which is unverifiable, so it's non-objective, it's completely subjective, uh, and we see this in the works, for example, of Barbara Marx Hubbard, who is a very key player in the New Age movement. Uh, and and the, there's a lot of nonsense, and we'll get into why that nonsense is there. It's partly to do with propagating a, a pacifist ideology so that the target populations of cultural Marxism don't wake up to the fact that certain things are happening inside their society. Uh, but it's also uh, partly the result of wrong-headed approaches of pure subjective standpoints. What could be loosely termed as solipsism, or an extreme form, it actually is an extreme form of solipsism, or uh, nihilism, where you're perfectly willing to accept self-destruction and unwilling to accept that you may actually have to stand up and push against something which is trying to damage you or your family or your society and so forth. Uh, so these, th that's just the first step of demoralization. Now we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more and then we'll move on to step two. So looking into the concepts that we discussed previously, demoralization, there's a few different things that are put out there uh, in order to achieve that. So the subverter, for example, will focus on the uncontrollable growth of the military-industrial complex, as an example. And they'll put out this propaganda, that's the interaction between the subverter and the target nation. So they'll put out this propaganda of pacifism, and what you end up with is a weakened military, right? Now, because this is a feedback loop, what you get is an even more increased uh, uncontrollable growth of the military industrial complex because it creeps towards totalitarianism and you end up with useless wars against words, actual words, right? For example, the war on drugs, which has been totally unsuccessful, the war on terror, which was an absolute disaster, uh, the war on... Um, uh, there's so many different wars they waged, the war on poverty, which again was an inevitable disaster, uh, and it required increased spending again and again and again, which balloons the national debt. So this is the process that they use to cripple a country economically, which is very clever. All you have to do is insert the subverter into the right place at the right time, whether it's within a governmental department or whether it's inside an academic institution, it doesn't matter. It, st it tends to work. The second thing that they might put out there uh, might be provoking local police conflicts, which we've seen in Ferguson, for example, in the US or in Baltimore. And the way that's done is there's propaganda put out there uh, towards social justice. Right? Uh, the term social justice is not recently coined. This started a very, very long time ago, and it was uh, originally thought up uh, in, under the auspices of Marxism, of cultural Marxism, uh, of communism, and of course of um, uh, the, the communist state, the Soviet Union. So the propaganda of social justice, of course, leads to less involvement 
in the political process, uh, which leads to, bizarrely, an expansion of state. Because if there's less people involved in the governmental process, you get more police conflicts, more uh, agitation between the public and the state, and then more uh, propaganda of social justice, more anger, more hatred, more resentment. Nothing ever gets resolved. That is the point of subversion. That is the point of psychological warfare, a lack of resolution. And you see this happening. Uh, you've also got the establishment of external ideologies which follows. Uh, and this involves uh, external ideologies, could be what we're seeing today, for example, with Islamism, uh, where that has become uh, based in the countries where it's been exported. Now we're seeing these jihadists that are homegrown terrorists. Uh, why is this? It's because of this process of subversion. Now, none of these things, unfortunately, are taught in schools, obviously for obvious reasons, which we discussed. Uh, education establishments no longer want to teach critical thinking. But uh, this needs to be taught in some form. Uh, I don't particularly want to be teaching anyone this. It's just that there is a, a moral compulsion on us now, an ethical compulsion to do so uh, if we don't want to see the downfall of the societies we live in, or, or, or damage, uh, mental damage, emotional damage, one might even term it as um, societal damage uh, as a whole on our families and the people we care about, on our friends, so we have to stand up for what is correct. Now, the interaction between the subverter in this case and the target nation when it comes to the external ideologies is you get culture wars, okay? The culture wars, uh, we're seeing that today, right now. Um, yes, I know there's an A missing in propaganda there, don't bring that up. I uh, <laughs> just drew this out very, very quickly. Um, but the culture wars are something we are now seeing uh, uh, right across the board between um, migrant populations and uh, the countries that they're coming into and, and the populations there or the cities and so forth. We're also seeing the culture wars in terms of the greater meaning of the word culture. Uh, that being the, the, the notion of, of the arts and so forth. So the arts and the, the, the uh, liberal sphere is now coming up against and clashing with uh, the conservative spheres with a small c uh, right across the board as well. Now, as I discussed before, we've also got this useless war against words, which is uh, leading to what we're going to talk about next, which is the shaming of non-compliance. So when somebody decides not to comply with this uh, foist upon uh, their person ideology, uh, what happens is they're silenced and they're censored. So they're silencing and censorship of critics, which happens uh, that's the interaction again from the subverter to the target nation. So the subverter is attempting to silence and censor any critics of their methodology, which of course leads to identity confusion. And inside identity confusion, we see people not being sure of their uh, social identity, racial identity, national identity, and again, this is happening right across the board. I'm not suggesting for one second that we should all become nationalistic or anything like this. I am anti uh, all things uh, which are authoritarian, which dictate to us who we should be. But at the same time, we do need to have a strong sense of self in order to interact with and coexist with the rest of the world around us. Because if we're not sure of ourselves, and our place in the world, we're never going to be sure when it comes to how we live our life or what we do or logic or uh, and, uh, you know, any of these kind of areas, they all go out the window, which causes deep psychological damage to us as human beings. You also get the phenomenon of mass hysteria taking place. So this plays into the social justice sphere again. Uh, so if you're not pro the propaganda of pacifism, if you're not pro police conflict, if you're not pro external ideologies, well then those people become hysteric, right? They become hysterics. They, 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 want, they, they behave in ways, and you see this happening more and more now, 
where they're behaving in ways which are, are not becoming of a, of, of a well-rounded, emotionally balanced person. Uh, so this is this is the mass hysteria phenomenon. It's again, uh, it's basically cult-like behaviour. Uh, you see this right across the board. Uh, eventually, the hope uh, that the subverter has in their interactions with the target nation is that they will get a docile population. So, if their their hope is that if they keep implementing these uh, methods, then the target population will fundamentally become docile. Uh, they'll become pacifistic, they'll become easy to take over. Uh, again, it's that long march through the institution's uh, idea. So that's uh, a broad uh, look at how that particular step inside the subversion process works. So that's a look into step one, which is the process of demoralization. Uh, we're now going to look into destabilization. So in step two of the process, you get destabilization, where, where uh, you have artificial bureaucratic systems and corporate monopolies injected into the target nation society to claim power inside a power vacuum. What does that mean? Well, you have um, certain types of oligarchs, such as George Soros, who, through his open society foundations, ends up climbing into that power vacuum uh, in order to agitate further problems that are already inherent inside that society uh, because obviously of step one which was demoralization. Now the target areas uh, for these sorts of things uh, seem to be the police and law and order uh, and the economy. Now, when it comes to George Soros, the example I was giving in this particular instance, if you take a look at what happened in Ukraine, his Open Society Foundations uh, caused the collapse and the destabilization of that entire nation, uh, which quote-unquote forced Russian forces to annex Crimea, uh, which predominantly supported uh, the Russian Federation. And we see that process of, of destabilization taking place in that country. We also see, prior to that, the demoralization process. You also see this uh, in the United States as well. So, for example, uh, with the riots across, and they weren't protests, they were riots across uh, Baltimore and Ferguson. Uh, and, and there was a lot of uh, burning of uh, private property that uh, was owned by black business owners. Uh, in the last uh, particular incident that was uh, covered nationwide, we see that the police officer uh, was in fact a black police officer, which contradicts the narrative that was being put out there by Black Lives Matter, which um, was being funded to the tune of three, $33 million by George Soros. So we have to ask the question, uh, what is going on in that situation? Uh, why is it that a false narrative was pumped out to the public instead of the true narrative? Is there a problem with racial relations? Well, if there wasn't before, there certainly is now. And the agitators are on both sides of the equation. Uh, but w w again, we've covered that in the demoralization process. Uh, the target areas, again, for destabilization are the police and law and order or the economy. Now, when it comes to the police, what happens is that criminals end up being hero worshipped and the police forces are demonized and vilified. Now, keep in mind that I am not for authoritarianism and therefore I'm also against the police state. But when you have uh, police officers being vilified and demonized for trying to keep the public safe from criminals who are typically carrying weapons, that could be argued to be, uh, again, there, there might be justifications for that, I don't know. Again, even if, even if there are racial tensions in that situation, they still need to be uh, addressed and dealt with. The, the, the crime rates and the figures and the statistics 
they don't bear up to scrutiny in so far as the again the propaganda that's put out there uh, by a lot of these groups and the fact that these groups also had people like Rachel Dolezal uh, spearheading them a white woman who was pretending to be a black woman you've got the Soros connection these are things that should concern people seriously before they consider aligning themselves with any organization the very first question you should ask yourself is is this person authentic and we find in, in most cases they aren't authentic people leading these quote-unquote revolutionary movements um, I, I was a great supporter of Malcolm X uh, uh, this is a point of contention with some of the people that I know but Malcolm X for example uh, uh, was pushing the idea of self-determination which is important for the black community because that uh, pays attention to the universal laws of action and consequence empowerment of self uh, black lives matter do not do that what they're peddling is a victim narrative it's a victim narrative and it's very very dangerous because it disempowers people rather than empowering them uh, but we see this with well, the economy of course uh, as, as a target area for destabilization you see the expansion of the welfare state uh, not in ways that are actually helping the public so the welfare state is it should be there and it is there as a safety net for the core population of that country and if it improves the lives of people good the problem is it's not improving the lives of people and instead what we get is uh, increased state spending on the welfare state but that money is not going to the communities which need it instead it's just going to fueling the bureaucracy inside the system so again this is completely in line and in tune with cultural Marxism we saw the same phenomenon in the former Soviet Union and we're seeing it uh, happening in these populations where these sleeper cells and whatnot uh, of cultural Marxists are active. So let's move on to step three. So step three in this process is the crisis phase. Within the crisis phase there are one of two ways it can go. You can either end up with a country that erupts in civil war or you can end up in an invasion scenario by a foreign power. Now we haven't reached this point of step three, the crisis yet. We are very much on the brink of it, on the verge of it. And this is one of the reasons why I'm putting this video out there is because I want to encourage critical thinking. It doesn't matter if you agree with all of my viewpoints or not. You're, no, no two people ever agree on everything. This is an impossibility uh, because we're all unique. Uh, individuals. We're not unique special snow snowflakes as the, the social justice warriors say. Uh, they're full of crap. Uh, they're again approaching it from a subjective standpoint but objectively what I'm saying is we all have different uh, views, different ideas. We shouldn't give in to universalism. We shouldn't give in to a communal mode of thinking because that's just a cult-like phenomenon. So as I say, we haven't come to civil war yet, nor have we come to invasion yet, but it could happen. And this is why I'm, I'm not promoting fear or peddling anything like that at all. I don't think people should be afraid uh, because fear just gives in to the enemy. What we need to be is educated, uh, properly educated. I mean, we have to have the knowledge and we have to apply that knowledge to prevent these outcomes. Because after this, there is no coming back from this. Once step three, the crisis happens, you will not have an opportunity to reverse that process. Uh, what follows on just is stabilization, normalization, where totalitarianism fundamentally takes over in a very overt way. There is no stopping that. Anyone who's worked in the intelligence field can tell you this is absolutely how these things work. The, these are the basic steps, the basic... I mean, it, it is... Uh, it can get a little bit more complicated than this, but in general terms, this is how it tends to go. Now, inside step three, you get the saviour figure. 
that is promoted. So this one single individual who will save the country. Uh, so as an example, we've seen that with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara during Cuba's quote-unquote liberation. Uh, we see this also with North Korea, with uh, Kim Jong-un, I believe it is now. Um, and we saw it with his predecessor, his father and his grandfather, they're all promoted not only as saviors, uh, and this will happen, this is why, why I'm explaining this, they're not only promoted as saviors, but they're promoted as uh, religious figureheads, ideological figureheads. It does become like a religion. The same thing happened with Stalin, which is where you get this concept of Stalinism, where everyone was revering him. Saddam Hussein implemented the same uh, methods. So subversion does work psychological manipulation does work so this is why we have to guard against it and when the savior figure appears we have to be very very careful and question whether this person actually is doing what is in the moral right uh, whether they're acting in an ethical manner whether they are in fact speaking the truth and this is another point I want to get across before we go on to step four. Freedom is fundamentally based on truth. A lot of people don't understand this. Morality is based on freedom and freedom is based on truth. And therefore, truth supersedes everything. That is the highest moral good. If you don't have the freedom to speak the truth, then you don't have any freedom at all which is, a, which is a, a, an immoral act. So if anyone ever seeks to curb your free speech, they are contributing uh, towards immoral action. And we see this happening. This is, this is why I'm bringing a lot of this up, is because we need free speech. We need to defend free speech, not as a right, which it is, but as also a fundamental basic principle of humanity because the whole reason we developed speech in the first place or writing or any of these things that we enjoy was because we had those freedoms if we hadn't had those freedoms they wouldn't exist so let's move on to step four so step four of this process is stabilization or normalization this is the point at which you get self-appointed rulers stabilizing the country by force. Now, they are no longer going to be employing the softly, softly approach. Uh, this is the point at which all useful idiots, or what they call expendable containers, are eliminated from the process because they've achieved their objectives. And so we do find this criminal cabal that is operating without restrictions presently doing exactly that. Right now they're going under the guise of cultural Marxism or Islamic extremism or uh, subverted socialist feminism. Uh, but regardless of what name they're given, they are accomplishing their goals and they are succeeding. Okay, And these people, they obviously don't have good intentions because they do want to see countries go through these processes and, and everything I've explained to you here is fully verifiable. None of this is subjective. It can all be objectively verified. Uh, this is why I'm presenting it. And it's important that people look into the work of other people that have uh, presented similar um, information to the public. Uh, it's important that people even look into the Metrokin archives which expose a lot of what the former KGB was doing, which the present day uh, SVR, the Sluzba Venishny uh, Rezvetsky, is, is engaged in. I'm afraid I don't speak fluent Russian, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Uh, I, I do speak Russian, just not to that extent. Uh, but the SVR, as they're termed in the uh, Russian Federation, uh, are basically just the former KGB uh, in disguise, if you will. Most of, most of the former KGB moves straight into the SVR. Uh, and the same thing with the FSB as well. Uh, so you've got uh, these two organizations. Of course, Putin himself, Vladimir Putin, 
was uh, formerly KGB and the SVR, the way the, 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 their present system is designed, reports directly to Putin. So don't be under the illusion that, that those people are capitalists just because they appear to have changed their economic system. Uh, they still retain that cultural Marxist uh, ideology and agenda, uh, which is why th th their kind of subversive influences can be seen, their fingerprints are right over everything. Um, that's not to say the Russian Federation is behind it all, certainly not. Uh, they themselves are under the thumb of cultural Marxists. Uh, I might go into this uh, a little bit more at a later date in another video. Uh, I might not, it just depends. Uh, but it's important that people, as I say, develop the critical thinking skills and do what's necessary before we get to step four. Uh, because that's where we're inevitably heading at the moment. Right now, we're only on step two. We can reverse that process, but we need to stand up for our freedoms. We need to stand up for our rights. We need to prevent censorship. Uh, we need to prevent this stigmatization uh, and othering of people that are expressing uh, dissent uh, from the system. And fundamentally, we need to push back against authoritarianism, which is what all of this ultimately is. Uh, the reason for that is because authoritarianism always leads to totalitarianism. And the way to spot totalitarianism, by the way, because it's very cleverly disguised many times, is to look at whether or not it has a utopian agenda behind it. If, they, if, if any group ever presents to you the concept of a utopia or a utopian vision, you know for a fact that that is going to fundamentally end up being authoritarian. There are many philosophers and writers that have written about this. I'm not one of them, <laughs> but feel free to check out the works of other people. Uh, so. I'll leave it there in terms of all of this and hopefully it will give you some food for thought. Thank you very much for watching.